Hello everyone, Camilla Roccapinti here from Decodable Readers Australia. I'm the new Director of Education for the company and I'm super excited about the year ahead. We have so many wonderful things in the pipeline for our community, from teaching tips to practical strategies, interviews with global influencers around the science of reading and a whole bunch more. So make sure you follow us on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel because there are some great things in the pipelines for 2021. We're going to actually kick off 2021 with a mini masterclass of what is the science of reading. Now, if you're just embarking on your journey, then this is a great one for you and your school as it starts to unfold. What is the science of reading? Where did it come from? What are these large bodies of inquiries and research? Cognitive scientists, reading specialists, reading researchers, all of them are converging on the same message. So what is that message? And what are the practical strategies to turn theory into practice? So that's what our mini masterclass is going to be about. Now, if you've been on your journey for a little while, you might even like this too, because it's those little moments of tick, I've got that in my programs, or tick, I know that I'm embedding those practices into my classroom. So sit back, enjoy. This presentation was actually presented at the Learning Difficulties Australia Conference in Brisbane, but we thought that we would like to share this with our community. Community. So our very first 2021 Masterclass, What is the Science of Reading? Thank you to everyone for tuning in today. This mini masterclass will outline a few key considerations about what is the science of reading and what sort of instructions and approaches you need for your classrooms. So sit back and enjoy as we dive in. The first thing we wanna look at is what is the science of reading? Now, Dr. Louisa Motes is one of my favorite reading researchers. She has been in the field for many, many years, has written uh, numerous books in which I have many of um, presented at many conferences and there's plenty free online as well but she is an expert in her field so I'm going to state exactly what her words are of the body of work referred to as the science of reading. She says it is not an ideology, a philosophy, a political agenda, a one-size-fits-all approach, a program of instruction nor a specific component of instruction. It is the emerging consensus from many related disciplines based on literally thousands of studies supported by hundreds of millions of research dollars conducted across the world in many languages. These studies have revealed a great deal about how we learn to read, what goes wrong when students don't learn, and what kind of instruction is most likely to work for the most students or best for the most students. Now, for me on my journey, I found that knowledge is power. It's the power to make change. So I encourage you to read and delve into the science of reading. There are many books. Here are some of my favorites to begin with. Mark Seidenberg, Language at the Speed of Sight, How We Read, Why So Many Can't and What Can Be Done About It. Great book. Obviously, Dr. Louisa Motes has many. This is one of the ones that I have, Language Essentials for Teachers. Uh, another great read, a bit tricky because very scientific, but it really is just so compelling and it's Reading in the Brain and that's by uh, Dr. Dahan, which is another great book. But my question to you is, are you on the journey? It's not actually about the destination. It's about embarking on the journey of the science of reading and making small changes so that we can have improvements in outcomes. So have you boarded the knowledge train? I love this quote, one of my favorite quotes, and you'll hear it widely in the reading science world. Do the best you can until you know better. When you know better, do better. This one really resonates with me as I create um, curriculum and instruction and coach teachers. As I know better, I do better. So it helps me review what I'm doing and just improve that instructional approach as well. So I encourage you to build your suite of knowledge. Now, recording your favorite YouTube clips around the science of reading, recording um, blog posts, there's many out there that I just absolutely love. And even more importantly are 
a library of books because it's these books that I keep coming back to. It's not just a, I'll read it once. Every time that I'm coaching, every time that I'm reviewing curriculum, we always go back to some of these in particular and uh, just ensure that we're aligning that instruction and practice to that science of uh, reading, that body of research. So I guess this is the question that I get asked the most. If the evidence is so compelling, why are so many children failing to learn to read? And I must admit there's some great uh, blog posts around this. If you've got the time, jot down the name Emily Hanford. She has um, got some great ones, why children can't read or why, why millions of children are failing to read. But I guess my approach is that there are three false theories. And those false theories just continue to persist in our Australian schools and globally. Number one, the false theory that reading is natural. It's as natural as speaking. Therefore, immersing children in print and literature will teach children to learn. Now, a very, very small percentage, this may work by immersion, but the majority of students learning to read need explicit instruction. Our written alphabetic symbols are so arbitrary and they require that explicit instruction of mapping those sounds to symbols. So reading isn't as natural as speaking comes. So that is a false theory. Number two, teaching children to guess words by looking at pictures, skipping over words, guessing words based on context will develop the strategies necessary for reading. And unfortunately, this is probably one of the biggest ones because these strategies are actually embedded in commercialised programs that are evident in our Australian schools and still are evident today. So in our reading science world, this is definitely a false theory that students always need to go back to sounding out and mapping those speech sounds to our symbols. It's a bit like cracking the code. We have a code there, which is our written symbols, our alphabet, and we need to map those to speech sounds to read those words. So looking at pictures, yes, you may guess the word correctly, but when that picture is not there or the context of the story is gone, the only thing you've got left are those letters and that's what we need to be able to read. And science proves that. All right, number three, there are hundreds of ways to teach reading. Therefore, no single way will work for all children. And we'll go into some of the science behind this of why that is actually false. And uh, Dr. Dahan will show us shortly um, by his research of why this is not true. All right, the other thing that makes me a little bit sad as well as I talk to university students coming out of university and teacher training facilities that um, they're not even taught based on these evidence um, and research uh, methodologies. They are still being taught some of these three false theories. So unfortunately, the teachers that are entering our schooling system are unfamiliar with the evidence-based um, methodologies as well. So what is the evidence? And Dahan states it clearly that based on brain imaging, and we're talking about thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of images, they are consistent again and again. And therefore, what needs to take place instructionally is fairly consistent as well. Now, he also states that it simply is not true that there are hundreds of ways to learn to read. When it comes to reading, all children have roughly the same brain that imposes the same constraints and the same learning sequence. Now, we know there are cognitive disabilities like dyslexia, and we're not going to go too far into that today, but the evidence does show us that instructionally they require some things. They just need a lot more practice and explicit um, instruction around those components, which we'll go into shortly. Now, all of though that evidence has come down and been put into a theoretical model, and you've probably heard of this uh, model, it's called the simple view of reading. Now, it does look simple, although it's quite complex. It talks about that reading comprehension, which is our ultimate goal, is a product of decoding and linguistic comprehension or language comprehension, I like to call it. Now, if we are able to decode words 
and understand the words that we've just read, then together the product is comprehension of that reading. Now, just on the side there of your screen, I saw a great little, um, I guess, product. And it, this just made sense to me and I wanted to share this as well. When we have one but not the other, like any product or times, we'll have zero. So if we've got decoding but we haven't got that linguistic comprehension, we won't have reading comprehension. If we haven't got decoding and we're guessing all those words but we understand the words, we don't actually really have reading comprehension. We probably have guessing comprehension, a little bit of it, but as far as what reading comprehension is, is zero. If we have neither decoding or linguistic comprehension, it's zero. You actually need both in order to get that end result of reading comprehension. Now, this has also been uh, put into another theoretical model. Um, it's called the reading rope, and it's just, uh, I guess, a more in-depth version of the simple view of reading. And it goes into word recognition, which you can see there in blue, and unpacks those key components that make up that word recognition. So it's not just knowing words by sight, and you'll soon learn that whole word reading is just not the way to go. We need to unpack and map that alphabetic principle. Um, so phonological awareness, hearing that phonemes, that sounds in words, syllables, phonemes, as in the individual sounds, that decoding process of the of the spelling and sound correspondences and sight recognition. Now, we will get into that, but that is when we do unpack that letter sound correspondences a few times and then we see words, we will do what we call orthographically map them, where it's part to whole by automaticity. And it looks like we know the word by sight, but our brain is just processing that really quickly. On the other side of the reading rope, on the top there, we've got our language comprehension. So it's about our background knowledge, not only about the facts and concepts, but about uh, vocabulary, language structures, verbal reasoning like inferencing, and then our literacy knowledge about print concepts, genres. So there's a lot going on. It's not as simple as the simple view of reading. It's actually quite complex. In fact, I think uh, Louisa Motes has a great article um, that uh, reading is actually rocket science because of these complex components that uh, weave uh, their way into skilled reading. All right, another one uh, favorite of mine who's a cognitive scientist, neuroscientist, um, uh, Dr. Mark Seidenberg says this, the answer is the same for all children. Cultural, economic and educational circumstances obviously affect children's progress, but what they need to learn does not change. So once again, let's have a look what's influencing practice now. There were three global uh, large scale reviews done about the best way to teach reading. Um, I've got here our Australian government one in the center and then we've got the UK and the US and they're all independent reviews of the best way to teach reading and they all converge on five and we've really called it the big six because there's an extra one of our language. So let's have a look at these five things that need to be incorporated into the science of teaching reading into our classrooms. So all of these studies indicate that students learn best when teachers adopt an integrated approach of teaching these things. Phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, and uh, underpinning all of those is the development of oral language, that receptive and expressive language and understanding language. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at each one of these. Let's start with phonemic awareness. The very first starting point of reading is sound. What a child must do to become a reader is to learn how those sounds connect to the words they say and then from those words into the written words. So the first step is phonological and phonemic awareness. So hearing sounds within words, so we can look at syllables, so larger sounds, whole, whole words, and then getting a little bit smaller is syllables, and then we can 
um, tune them into rhyme and alliteration. But what ultimately we want to get them to is phonemic awareness. They're the individual sounds in words. And we have 44 speech sounds in the English language. So another quote from Dr. Louisa Motes, one of the most robust findings of modern reading research is that proficient reading is strongly associated with the ability to identify, remember and sequence phonemes. So this phonemic awareness is so crucial and it's often the step that's missed most when you're purchasing or running programs that are commercialized. So phonemic awareness, let's have a little look at phonemic awareness. Now, Dr. David Kilpatrick is one of my favorite um, reading researchers. He's got some great books around phonemic awareness. And he identifies phonemic awareness into multiple um, categories. So looking from beginner to advanced. So there's different levels of phonemic awareness. So we start off from identifying and isolating phonemes in words. What's the beginning sound? What's the end sound? What's the middle sound? So hearing a word like k at and identifying the k, the a and the t at the end is the beginning phase of phonemic awareness. Now the next part is actually blending and segmenting those words with all components. So if I am giving a child m at, they need to be able to blend those sounds and say mat, mat. Or the other way around, giving a child a word and them segmenting that word into individual phonemes. Dog, d o g. So that blending and segmenting of phonemes at phoneme level is super important. Now, I do commonly hear an approach of phonemic awareness can be done blindfolded. Now, although I know the intentional or to intentionality of being blindfolded because it's all about sound, but phonemic awareness is actually a visual as well. It's not visual to graphemes, but it's a visual to your mouth. Students need to be able to see how each sound is being produced, where the tongue, the teeth, the lips are placed. So phonemic awareness is a visual and auditory activity. And it's important that they are able to see exemplar practice in producing those speech sounds and explicitly being taught those speech sounds as well. Now, moving on to more of an advanced skill of phonemic awareness, this here is the phoneme manipulation. That's adding, deleting, and substituting um, a sound within words. Being able to manipulate sounds in words is super important. So, for example, saying each, now say b at the start, beach, or deleting a sound, um, as well as substituting, saying hot, and changing it to hat, which sound changes, and having students being able to identify the difference and hear that substitution and where that substitution is happening. Now, phonemic awareness is super important, but my, I guess, take away is that if you are following a sequence of sounds, why not tune in that phonemic awareness to that sequence of sounds? Coming up uh, very soon is the Decodable Readers Australia uh, Literacy Toolkits. And these toolkits are going to have all of these components in it. But when we look at phonemic awareness in our level one with our sat pin sounds, sat, p, i, n, those sounds are going to be represented in our phonemic awareness drills of those sounds. It's super important to have students tune in to what you want them to learn rather than overwhelming them too much with all 44 speech sounds all at once. However, that process is definitely important that they understand, hear and articulate um, those 44 speech sounds. So the next component is phonics. This is the mapping of those speech sounds to those letters. We need to make sure we incorporate a synthetic, systematic sound to print phonics and spelling program. 
because not all phonics is appropriate. It needs to be systematic. I know some schools that tick off their little phonics, you know, I've got phonics and they do incidental phonics where when something pops up in a book they're reading, that's what they get taught. But often um, some of our speech sounds are missed and students end up with gaps in their learning. So that systematic approach is super important. Synthetic means part to whole. Uh, it doesn't mean not real synthetic, it means part to whole, that we've got many parts to create that whole and we'll go into that very shortly. Now at Decodable Readers Australia, there is a explicit and systematic instruction for their synthetic phonics program. And I know that many schools now have and include their system. And what's super important is just that you're beginning with some very basic common sounds of short vowels and uh, consonants where you can begin to build words and manipulate sounds in words at a very early level. If we just follow the um, alphabet, then it's going to take quite a few weeks before you can start building uh, words as well. Some of our common letters and letter sounds like our S and our T happen at the end of the alphabet or close to the end. So going in alphabetical order just does not make sense. The synthetic part I want to talk about. This is that part to whole. Students need to know that a word is made up of letters, yes, that represent our speech sounds. So for example here we have the word have. Now it, this is not looking at rules because of, obviously uh, people would see the word have and, and refer back to, the, I think they call it um, bossy e, magic e, and then this one breaks the rule, this one's a sight word. What we actually have to do is go back to that orthographic mapping. That have has three sounds, but four letters, H -a -v. And what happens here is the H, the letter H, should I say, maps to our H sound. Our letter A maps to our at sound in this word. And our V and our E together map to our V sound because in the English language, um, we don't end words with the letter V. So the E has a job here to protect that V and that's making a V sound, two letters making one sound. So students will get to the understanding, especially at sight word level, where we can still map part to whole our sounds to print or our print to sounds in this manner. Now let's have a look at the word want. I know this one is a sight word that uh, traditionally teachers used to say, you just need to know this because um, it's a word that will pop up. Well, actually want has an irregular phoneme grapheme correspondence, but it's not as irregular as what you think. The word want, the a in want is making an o sound because it's next to the W. And that's quite a common thing if we have a look at the word was and wasp and watch and wand. So when we teach phonics, we teach it in a synthetic way, that part to whole. We break everything up and we explicitly teach those components and then we put it back together. Now the other thing that I really encourage schools to do is investigate words in a fun and engaging way. Making sure that this part to whole is always that focus because that's what's going to bring students to the understanding of how words work. If we have a look at this little example here in lipstick, we can see that how many sounds, how many letters we teach, uh, how many consonants and vowels and syllables. Obviously, all of these things have been explicitly taught before we investigate the words. So it's really important that we are using this language of sounds and letters and consonants and vowels and syllables because this is what's going to be the core of learning to spell, transferring that reading and spelling knowledge, which I believe are two sides of the same core. Now the other part to synthetics, obviously with phonics we've got the letter sound mapping but there's also another component and that's just understanding units of meaning more than just phonics. I want to tell you a quick little story um, that happened not so long ago. Uh, a little boy read the word unhappy, totally understood the word unhappy meant sad. Um, it made sense in the context he was reading it. And then he came to the word unable. 
and we discussed what able means to be able to do something so I asked him well what's unable because un being a unit of meaning but he hadn't been explicitly taught unable um, and he also hadn't been explicitly taught that the morpheme of un meant the opposite to so although he knew whole words like unhappy he had never been able to break down unhappy into its meaning parts un and happy therefore when he came to other words he was unable to unable um, to break it down into its meaning parts which would have been really useful in this context he was actually in year two he was quite a good reader uh, at decoding level but the understanding wasn't there and it was really evident that his lack of comprehension was because he didn't understand the components of words when we when it came to morphology so that's a very brief introduction of why morphology is important but it really aids understanding when we understand how words are made up in their individual meaning units all right the last thing around phonics is that we need cumulative practice. Now, too many times I've seen phonics being taught in isolation in a 30 minute lesson, and then the books that students are practicing don't match the phonic instruction being taught in that lesson. It's super important to have decodable books. These are texts that contain that specific phonic knowledge in which the students have been taught. So they don't consist of complex, irregular spellings of too many words, a few sight words in amongst them, but this is that practice. We need to set our students up for success. This is how they enjoy reading. And these types of books are what gets them there in their practice level. And they're sequential, they're systematic, and they're structured, providing the student with everything they need leading to reading success. So one of those things that needs to also be addressed during this cumulative practice time is the instructional approach. This really matters. No more round robin reading. Too often I've seen round robin reading where a child comes to a word they don't know a more capable child jumps in and tells them what the word so that instructional approach just wasn't um, I guess I wasn't even able to instruct the teacher what to do in that uh, moment. Round robin reading doesn't allow all students to be engaged at the one time. So once students have read their page, they know they won't be called upon to read for a little while longer. So they tend to switch off even if their fingers moving across the page. What we actually need to do is we need to group those students and allow them to all engage in the reading at one time. So based on their phonics knowledge, um, if that's what your focus is during that reading time, you need to give instant feedback. And this is where if each child is engaging in the reading process, it's the teacher that moves around the the group. The group is spread out just a little bit so that they don't interrupt each other's reading and it's the teacher that can fit in between listen and give that instant feedback and prompting to sound out. And as you know, gone are the days of all of those uh, reading strategies. We don't need however many are there, nine, ten. Um, we need to get students back to sounding out the words and knowing that letter sound correspondences. All right, moving on to fluency. Fluency focuses and relies on decoding first, then moves to that orthographic mapping skill. That's where students have come across these words so many times from part to whole that their brains are just knowing these words almost like they know it by sight. Um, so fluency is that development from knowing those letter sound correspondences to work out words to then that instant or automaticity of words. If we have a look here, we know that fluent readers do not spend a lot of mental energy on decoding text. So what they need to be doing is knowing those words automatically and that comes from that cumulative practice so that less cognitive energy is spent on working out those words and more on understanding the text. So we need to get our readers to be at skill level with orthographically mapping those words and reading quickly. 
Now, the other thing to note with fluency strategies that the blend as you read process is extremely important. I've seen a lot of students do the stop start sounding out. And for some students, this can really hinder actually hearing that word as a whole. So blending as you read is extremely important. And you can do this by sliding the finger across and teaching that and modeling that from the start. Now, if you have students that um, uh, are finding decoding a little bit tricky, start with your continuance sounds, because as those sounds blend onto the next sound, the students are able to hear them a little bit better. Fluency is also about pace, intonation and attendance to punctuation. Too often I've actually seen teachers put too much emphasis on words per minute where a student is actually racing to beat their words per minute score that they're actually not even listening to what they're reading. They're more focused on reading the words with so much speed. So it's important to explicitly teach how do we read a story with the right pace, the right intonation, and especially attendance to punctuation. Have a discussion also about the book to activate any prior knowledge and build that field knowledge, build that content, content build the experiences as well into um, the talk time before reading. All right, the next one is vocabulary instruction. Vocabulary needs to be directly and indirectly taught. When you're reading a book through a shared experience, that's and a word that is unfamiliar comes up, obviously you're going to put attention to it and indirectly put um, meaning to uh, the book. However, in saying that, we need to also plan direct instruction around vocabulary and use repetition and multiple exposures to those words. And I'll give you a little example. Uh, we're in a year one classroom and the word was allocated. And we went through the process of teaching, explicitly teaching a word and adding a action because an action is very powerful for memory retention. And we did a little action for allocated but not only did we teach it in regards to the story, which said that the characters bought a movie ticket and they went to their allocated seating. We then shared experiences of if anything has been allocated in which a little boy had mentioned he went on a plane trip and had an allocated seat. But then through context, we then used the word allocated, for example, um, boys and girls, you need to go and eat in your allocated area and don't forget to play in your allocated play areas and the playground is allocated to year ones. The word allocated was used uh, in multiple and repetitious ways for students to really understand the word in context. Now, Decodable Readers Australia have that explicit instruction in their books of words that are used or implied in their stories. All right, the next one is comprehension. Now, you've probably seen a load of comprehension strategies taught in isolation. The science of reading is really moving towards uh, language comprehension in building field knowledge, building understanding first at vocab level and in experience level as well. So it's really important. We, we can't infer, we can't predict unless we actually understand the story. So it's important to have that general understanding and experience rather than going straight to isolated comprehension strategies as well. All right, the way to teach comprehension is to use think alouds, explain and model your thought processes. And this can be done while inferencing and making a connection to a text. Once you've actually found out that all of your students understand the text. So students in year one and prep can inference from their material. And I'm going to tell a little story about uh, a prep classroom and a fishing story. Now, we had some students that understood about fishing. We built that field knowledge of what is fishing and what sort of equipment you use to build, uh, to fish. And we read this story about a granddad and his, uh, and his grandson that went fishing. And granddad was a great fisherman, caught lots of fish. And one day granddad was a bit sick, so dad had to come out and fish. 
Now, during it, it went through the story of baiting the hook and throwing it out. And at the very end of the story, it said that all dad caught was a cold. So it didn't say whether dad was a good fisherman or not or what happened, but I asked the children, do you think dad was a good fisherman? And every single child said no. And they were able to infer that dad wasn't a good fisherman because he didn't catch any fish. And grandpa was a good fisherman because he caught lots of fish. Children in prep can infer. In fact, their language comprehension is far more developed than their reading or their decoding comprehension. So it's important to make sure that you use rich text and lots of language experiences to develop the language comprehension side. Now, early instruction is definitely the key. This is what matters, prevention rather than intervention. We need that prevention oriented approach to reading and catching kids early, right from prep and year one. So I'm a bit, big advocate of the year one phonics screener. Um, I've read all about the trials in South Australia and I um, keep up to date with the trials that are happening, especially in New South Wales in 2021, are going to be collecting that uh, phonics check for year one as well. So we'll keep an eye on that and keep you updated as well. All right, before we go, I want to go back to just a couple of little things. Do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, do better. So you guys are the advocates for change. And the reason why change is so hard in schools is because there's a lack of knowledge. So I encourage you to join that train, that knowledge train, and build your knowledge because knowledge is power for change. I also challenge you to, in your schools, challenge the false positive results. When we are using questionable assessments, uh, like PMs that are using those false theories and getting positive results, they're actually false positive. It's not a real indication of understanding everything about a child and how they're learning to read. You can't gain understanding of where they are in their knowledge of the alphabetic principle and their phoneme grapheme correspondences from assessments like these. Having a level assigned to a name is absolutely not enough. So that's why I encourage to challenge the false positive results, challenge those questionable assessments and get evidence-based practices in your classroom. Thank you so much for tuning in today. That was a very brief overview of what is the science of reading. We certainly could spend hours in each component, but that hopefully uh, whet your appetite to learn more. We have so much ahead in 2021, so make sure that you jump on board on our Facebook page, on our YouTube channel, and on uh, Instagram. We have our learning lounge. We have little teaching tips. We'll have more research unpacked. We are going to join that learning train with you and guide you on your way. Thank you so much for tuning in today.